All right, time's up, time to go. Good afternoon. Uh, I hope everybody's up and ready to sit still. Uh, I, I went back and forth on, on how to title uh, this month's uh, Apex for Lunch, but uh, I thought sit still was probably the most, maybe not the best, but I, I thought it fit and it was the most apt. We'll start as I normally do uh, with the pandemic and where are we? And, and some of these numbers are just, uh, wow. Uh, the very first one here in January, when we did this, we reported 312.3 million infections. And within the month, yesterday, day before yesterday, we were at 412, there were about another 100 million people uh, got infected or the infections were reported. We have to understand, and I've said this several times, the, the reporting tends to be underreported in various parts of the world because they don't have strong public health systems. Uh, many parts of the world do have uh, strong public health systems and we get, we get reasonably good reporting. But you see 100 million more infections, but in that period, there were only reported 300,000 more deaths. So the, the amount, the, the percentage of people dying from the, the pandemic from COVID has, has dropped off, but the infection rate has gone up. In the US, we went from 62 to 77 million. We added 15 million. Uh, and if you take 15 million, that, that's 25% or just under 25% oh. of the 62 million that we had last month. Uh, and we added that 25% extra on there. So uh, we've seen that, but again, the death, the number of deaths reported, we went over 900,000 uh, in total, beginning to end, starting in, in 2020. Mexico had 5.3 million. They went up a million, again, about 25%. Uh, and their deaths went up slightly higher, 17 out of 300. Uh, but the vaccination numbers grew as well with almost a billion more vaccinations done uh, between our January meeting and now. And same note as before, you look at... Uh, where the new cases are going and it's dropping uh, very, very quickly. So the CDC has come out and they've redone some of their uh, guidance and uh, they're, they're saying we can relax a little bit, but keep your mask handy just in case you need it. <clears throat> We've made it into the classroom <laughs> in, in more ways than one, unfortunately. Uh, my homework was stuck on a boat because of international supply chain related port delays. Um, <laughs> I, I found this interesting, thought I'd throw it in. But the problems are shifting. Uh, the ships now are adjusting their speed uh, to, to time their arrival uh, at the various ports. Now, we look at this and say, well, they're doing that for, for Los Angeles and, and uh, Long Beach. And that's not, that's not the totality. They're, they're, the ports now are working with the shipping companies and with the individual ships and telling them when they expect they'll be able to bring them in. And so the ships are adjusting their speed and they're to get their arrival times at the port to coincide when, when, there's, when there's going to be a berth open. Now, this is especially important for those large ships that are, that are carrying uh, 20, 25,000 containers. Uh, the, the smaller ships, it's much easier. They don't have as much concern, but the big ships, those ships, uh, they have to go to special docks with special handling equipment in order to, to uh, get the service they want. So it's really important, but they've gotten the process. It's not completely smooth yet, but the process is, is being developed and smooth that will allow them to find out exactly when the dock is going to be available for them 
and they can adjust their speed so that they don't have to stay at anchor. That they can slow down, speed up, and get to the port on time. <clears throat> the other thing that's happening is empty containers. <clears throat> well, remember, we talked about this in December and again last month. Uh, there are a lot of companies that have been sitting around with their inventory and containers, and now the sell off at Christmas emptied their warehouses. And so they're emptying the containers and getting the containers to come back. The dock, the dock management says to the truckers, if you're coming in, you can't get a full one unless you bring us an empty one. And that sounds like a really cool deal. They, they go, they find an empty container, they, they haul it to the dock, they turn it in, they get a full one, and they, they get a paid load going out. Uh, but there are issues with that as well. Uh, the complaints from the truckers are the gates aren't open at lunchtime, they shut down. And so that holds everyone up. Uh, I, I was quoting, uh, I didn't put the quotes around it, but the only two gates open due to labor shortages was at uh, Long Beach. Uh, they have 10 gates for returning containers and only two of them were open. So they had 10 lines of trucks. This, this is this is like us trying to cross the border, right? Uh, there, there are 10 lanes uh, where, where you can go in, but they've only got uh, they, they've only got customs people in two gates. So you 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 think you've got a big wide opening, and it gets narrowed down, and then there's all that chaos, uh, and you can't take the full one until you they take the empty. So the truckers are caught, and this is costing them time. And they don't get paid while they're sitting there. So there's there's a lot of noise coming from uh, the various truckers. Uh, a, a trucker, Pier Trucker, New York, New Jersey, who uh, Pier Truckers uh, aren't over the road truckers. Uh, Pier Truckers do all of the drayage work around the the uh, various facilities in New York and New Jersey. Uh, they're they're taking care of all of the uh, ins and outs around the port, uh, and so this person's job is to to move trailers and move containers. Uh, and so he took a picture of this. This is trying to return the container, and you're sitting in the driver's seat of this truck, and and that's what you see. You see a long, 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 long line. And they're waiting. Everybody sitting there is waiting to be allowed in so that they can return the container they have, have it taken off of their chassis. A full one gets put on their chassis and away they go. Uh, but that problem with the empty containers is now rippling back uh, through the, the dock areas uh, because the ship, uh, the shippers don't want to put too many empty containers on the ships. They want to put all the full on first and then whatever space they've got left, they want to fill with empties. And the problem with that is that requires that material coming in with, or containers coming in with material into the dock area has to be moved in front of all of the empties. And so you've got this churn going on on the floor. Uh, instead of first come first serve, you're getting uh, whatever sequence the shipper wants to put stuff onto the ship, uh, that's that's what they're doing. And so the docks are the docks are doing overwork because they're handling things multiple times. So this is still a snarl. It's it's not it's not smoothed out. In case you missed it, there was a trucker protest in Canada, and. It struck me as rather strange when I heard that this was going to happen and then when it happened, uh, because they said that the Canadian truckers were protesting the vaccine regulations. They had to be vaccinated in order to cross into the US and the US truckers had to be vaccinated to cross into Canada. And you say, well, okay, maybe that's an issue. Tell me a little bit more. But when you dig down into the facts, 90, 
over 90% of the Canadian truckers are vaccinated. If, if you look demographically, they are one of the highest rates of vaccination anywhere in the world for a group of people. And the reason for that is they don't want to get sick. If they get sick, they don't get paid. And they want to earn money. They have to earn money or they're, they're going to lose their truck. So they want to get paid. More than 85% of the trucks are, are company-owned trucks. The, the owner-operator uh, owns the truck and his or her company uh, runs it. So these people only get paid if the truck is moving. Uh, they're, if they're sitting still, they're not, they're not getting uh, any money. But they decided that they were going to protest. And there was a lot of, of tweets going in and out, a lot of, of uh, work over the CB radios and everything. Someone started a GoFundMe account to make sure that the protesters would be taken care of. And they raised more than $10 million. Now, GoFundMe uh, was fine with that until their, they started a fracas one day in Ottawa. Uh, and it, broke, it, it just broke out into a fist fight, about 10 or 15 people. Uh, and that word got back to GoFundMe. And they said, oh, it's a violent protest. We're not going to support it. And they took down the account. And they're refunding the money back to whoever donated it. Uh, and they took away the $10 million. Why was there $10 million? We have people that set up GoFundMe accounts for uh, all kinds of really good reasons. Uh, their, their child is dying of something and they're trying to raise money for it. Uh, GoFundMe is a really cool organization. But I don't know if I, I wasn't able to find out if they'd ever had a GoFundMe account that accumulated that much money. And it happened very, very quickly. It only took a few days. They went from, yeah, we've got a GoFundMe account to we've got $10 million uh, in less than a week. So there must have been some big money from somewhere getting pumped into that. In the post uh, protest, and that protest only lasted for a couple of days. Uh, but then there were some other things that happened, and we'll get to that in a second. But most of the commentary that came out, the, the tweets and all of the, the various things that were going on on social media, a lot of those came from sources in Eastern Europe and in Asia, which makes you wonder, what did that have to do with Canadian truckers? Uh, here's a cut from the New York Times. Uh, from I believe it was Sunday uh, the 13th. Uh, and they were arresting the protesters on the bridge. At, <clears throat> at that point, uh, the, the truckers had all, all left. Uh, they had about 70 trucks still there. Some of them were pickup trucks. Uh, and they, that's what they were using to block the bridge. They towed those trucks out and then they had a bunch of people blocking the bridge. Uh, again, had nothing to do with Canadian truckers. It had to do with some other agenda, but that agenda wasn't clear. Hundreds of trucks went to Ottawa and they parked in the streets, they flashed their lights, they blew their horns and they sat still and they protested. And, and people got highly irate uh, because they were blowing their horns. Uh, a lot of those air horns in downtown uh, kept people from being able to work in the offices. But then hundreds of trucks went back to work because they couldn't sit there and not make money. And some small group of protesters ended up blocking the bridge and continued the protest using about 70 trucks. And the question now that the Canadian government is involved is who were those people and what were they doing there? So what was the impact of all of this? Ford and GM have uh, assembly lines in St. Catharines, Ontario. Uh, if you cross this, the bridge that they were blockading goes from Detroit uh, across into uh, Southern Ontario. And then St. Catharines is, is on the way from there up to uh, Toronto. But uh, it's a, there, there are several big facilities there. 
uh, they idled those facilities and said it was because of the protest. But the question is whether it was because of the protest or was it the lack of ICs, integrated circuits? Because Ford had already said that they were going to idle several of their assembly plants because they wanted to build up inventories ahead so that they could run them uh, in a reasonable fashion. They were starting and stopping the line, starting and stopping the line because they didn't have all the components. And so they decided instead to idle those facilities for two to three weeks, accumulate the inventory and then start back up. There were similar protests in France, the Netherlands and Germany. And I'm thinking that was probably not Canadian truckers uh, that were protesting in those countries, but they were sort of wrapped into the same type of protest. They, the people that were protesting said they were gonna have a huge protest at the Super Bowl. Um, I, I didn't see it. Uh, if they had it, it was in the parking lot and, and it was pregame because nobody talked about it. So uh, maybe there'll be one for the State of the Union. There have been people saying, yeah, we're gonna have a, we're, we're gonna have a trucker strike in, in Washington, DC. Um, but that's probably not ca Canadian truckers either. So this thing got a name tacked on it, but it didn't have a whole lot of, of substance. So what does this have to do with us and what's going on? There are other people involved, there are other groups involved and they're trying to disrupt trade. Why? I don't know yet. Uh, I'd be interested in finding out, but we may see that here. Uh, for those of you who've been around for a while, you probably remember when the farmers decided to blockade uh, the free bridge. Uh, this was back in the late 80s, I believe. Um, but uh, they blockaded, they put a blockade right, at the, right on the border. And when the Mexican customs authorities would come running up the bridge to try and move them, they would move across to the US side of, of the international boundary. And if the US people came up the bridge, they would move back over to the Mexican side of the boundary. And they, they shut down that bridge and they kept it shut down for about three days. And that was before that we only had a two lane bridge at Zaragoza at that point. So if, if you were lucky enough to have been working uh, in Juarez at the time, what you probably remember was crossing the Zaragoza bridge going into Juarez and, and you were driving through a tunnel of, of, of uh, tractor trailers that went all the way through Waterfield and all the way out to uh, Gomez Morin. So uh, we, we probably won't see anything quite that bad, but uh, there's a possibility that we'll see interruptions in uh, cross-border trade at some point this spring. There's some good news out there though. I didn't want this to all be bleak. Uh, so I thought I'd, I'd find some good news uh, to share with you. Uh, electric truck deployments could jump tenfold as internet surges. Uh, this came from a study uh, that was done by, by a, a marketing group that wanted to find out uh, what was going on with electric trucks. Um, and they, I mean, it wasn't just electric trucks. They also looked at uh, self-driving vehicles, autonomous vehicles. And what the interest area, what the interest was there. But I found this one, this one primarily uh, of interest. Uh, the use of electric trucks uh, is growing primarily in California. They've got some very strong uh, emission standards, and they're uh, trying to reduce the emissions overall. So when you look at it. Uh, you've got 1,215 zero emissions trucks that are in use in, in California uh, as of the end of the year. And there are open orders now for 140,000 more uh, globally. Companies are, are trying to buy uh, these vehicles. There are two kinds, uh, two major types here. One is the battery and one is the hydrogen fuel cell. Now the battery is just like an electric car. Uh, 
you you have to plug the truck in or or like a forklifts uh you you plug the the thing in you charge up the battery uh and once the battery is charged then you're off and running the hydrogen fuel cell you have to pump hydrogen into your tank uh and you have a hydrogen tank and then that hydrogen is used in the fuel cell to interact chemically and generate electricity which then uh runs the the uh drives that move the truck so these vehicles have limited travel distances they they can't go like a diesel truck uh you, you load up a diesel truck you get on on the interstate you get it up to 70 miles an hour and you just go uh and and you can go long long distances uh without too many problems uh the electric vehicles don't go as far on a charge uh the the battery powered don't go as far as the fuel cell powered and neither of them go as far as diesel uh so what that what that says is that for some uses diesel will continue to be preferred but for others there may be there may be some use for those alternatives and and this got me thinking what if the uh people that are hauling to the border and crossing the border uh a lot of those trucks don't go very far uh they're usually right here along the border if and we're currently fighting again with uh the EPA because our air quality has deteriorated or the standards have lowered and we're not able to meet them whichever it is uh so what if uh companies here look to invest in either uh battery powered or fuel cell and use those to move product across the the international boundary uh when they're not moving they're not using uh they sit still they they're not burning a the battery they're not doing anything they're just sitting still so if they're sitting in line they're not burning fuel they're not idling they're just sitting and then you step on the accelerator and it moves electricity to the drives and the drives move the vehicle so that's what they're doing with them in california they're using them around the docks area and and for those uh hauling uh the the port haulers uh around the ports moving these trailers and and containers in and out so they're using them for dredge and short short haul runs in urban areas they're quiet uh they don't burn fuel they don't they don't contribute to the pollution uh and they don't burn anything when they're sitting still they just stop consuming energy so going back for just a second to to this um this would be one answer to cutting back on some of the uh air pollution issues that we are experiencing here but it it might also be uh interesting from the point of view that you could take uh electric vehicles and make them autonomous uh we had a a group that was doing uh experiments using autonomous vehicles from El Paso to LA uh that was 3 or 4 years ago they they ended that study uh and they moved on but there is a group now that's operating autonomous vehicles between Dallas and Houston and San Antonio and Houston and they're uh they still have a rider in the cab uh that can take over the controls if anything goes wrong uh but uh basically the vehicle is driving itself and they're they're using it to haul freight and they're they're looking at what the cost savings would be and how that how that might work so this is something that I'll I'll continue to investigate and see see if I can find more details on that uh because I I think that that's something that would be uh interesting to to understand okay uh i wanted i wanted to uh tie into 
and 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 I actually started this whole thing uh, thinking about this, and then I I went back to sit still. Uh, I I grew. I, I don't know how many of you had this experience, but when I was in school, uh, grammar school, elementary school, uh, the most the, the most popular words that I heard were sit still, sit still, quit wiggling, sit still. Uh, I, I guess I wasn't hyperactive, but I, I like to move around. Uh, Taichi Ono created what we call the Ono circle. Uh, he would use a piece of chalk and he would draw a circle on the floor. And then he would take an engineer, usually a young engineer who was just starting out, and he would have that engineer stand in the circle. And he would stand there all day. Ono would get him in the afternoon and take him back to his office. And the engineer would tell Ono what he had seen, what he had learned, what he had discerned watching uh, these operations. And depending on how the interaction went, Ono would repeat this with that engineer several times. Uh, and then finally would say, okay, uh, now here's the list of things that you've, you've observed. These are the things that you need to fix. And he would hand him back the list. And that became the work uh, package for that particular engineer. The, the underlying rationale for this is we walk through our manufacturing uh, plants uh, I, I'm an avid floor walker. I love going out and watching. Uh, I've been enamored of manufacturing for all, all of my years, basically. And so I like to go out and walk the floor. But if you go out and you stand still, you don't move, and you watch, what do you see? You see people in action. You see things going on but you also notice the things that don't flow smoothly. You don't notice that. If you're moving, you don't notice what else is moving. You don't notice what else is, is struggling, what else is moving quickly, unless they blow by you in the aisle. Uh, and so standing still and focusing, you can learn a lot uh, with this effort go out, stand in that circle and, and look around and see what's there. And so going out, checking it out, takes an opportunity, gives you an opportunity to, to learn. You can do this in an office. You can do it at home. Stop, stand still. Don't talk, don't walk around. Just stand still. And you go, oh, Chet, really? I did this with a, a management group uh, in a yogurt plant in Europe. And that group came out of that exercise and saved the company about $6 million. Uh, the company thought what they needed to do was put in a new packaging line and what they found by standing still and watching for an hour. And that was the most difficult thing was getting those people to stand still for an hour, not talk and not reach out and help people. Uh, but they came out of there with the realization and the understanding they didn't need a new packaging line. They needed to put different processes in place with the packaging lines they had. Do you have a packaging line somewhere in your plant? that needs to be looked at. So stand still. What would you like to discuss next time? What's causing you problems right now? What are your issues, your concerns? So give us your idea. Some of our ideas come directly from you. Those are the ones that uh, we enjoy the most. So uh, you can go to the chat box and put your idea in there, or you can email it to me and there's my email address right there. It, we also wanted to make sure that you knew uh, this is our 40th anniversary year. 
of Apex in El Paso. Uh, I think right now I'm the oldest established member. I joined the chapter in 1984. Uh, I have been a member of Apex since 1977, but I didn't get here until 1984. So I've been a member of the El Paso Juarez chapter for about 38 years. Uh, and we're doing well and we plan to continue into the future. So stay tuned. We're going to have some more events this year. We're going to do uh, different events, uh, live streaming things and trying some, some different, uh, some different uh, options for getting the word out. And it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be this if we didn't advertise. So be aware, we've got uh, classes coming up. Uh, we've got inventory and purchasing management uh, starting uh, two weeks. Uh, CPIM uh, part one is going to start about the same time. We've got a demand driven uh, certification review class uh, for those of you who might be interested in demand driven MRP. Uh, and we've got planning demand and SNOP management on March 26th. And then CSCP and CPIM. If you're interested, contact Deanna and she will uh, take your information and get you all the information. Uh, Eva, Eva just chimed in and said, I joined somewhere around 1990, maybe 1992. Uh, any of the others of you that are out there, when did, when did you join? Uh, when when did you uh, get involved? Uh, anybody been involved longer than I have? Uh, I know a couple of people in Apex that have been there longer than me. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see which ones of us continue. Anyway, have a great month, uh, and we'll see you again in March if we don't see you before. Thanks, Chet. Thanks, Chet. Thank you. Thank you, Chet. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.